Hello everyone, I'm Randy Suarez, aka Silver Card Today we're back here with another any news reaction. This I, I told y'all I was gonna be back with this one. The biggest flexes in East Sky 2. Now, I already reacted to the first one that he, that he dropped. I will leave that in the link down below in the description. You can watch it. And um my thoughts about it and like I said with the certain part that I wish they could have kept in an Isekai show. I get it, it was gruesome and everything, but hey, it will actually probably bring some views. But anyway, <clears throat> Anyway, there's a lot of flexing in anime in general, especially in Isekai. So, he's going to explain it more. So, if you like any of this content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Like, comment, subscribe to uh, any news. I will leave the original link to this video down below in the description. You can watch it uninterrupted. So, without further ado, let's get started. Whenever we think about a flex in anime, usually we refer to these overwhelming displays of might and power. Scenes like how I showed in the first episode where groups of people to entire armies just get absolutely decimated by one single entity. Mm -hmm. Those typically are the most entertaining to watch, but in a genre where literally anything is possible, not every flex needs to involve that iconic display of overpoweredness. Yeah. Once again, that's not a real word, but for the sake of describing protagonists in Isekai, I think I'm just gonna stick with it. So, while there are still plenty of scenes to cover like Ainz's goats, Gate's helicopter attack, and so much more, for this episode, I want to focus on something a little bit different. They're definitely still satisfying flexes to watch, but it's just the way it happens isn't through the standard, oh you underestimated my power type thing. In fact, none of these flexes relate to that type of power at all. No, instead it's more so people getting owned by the protagonist's wit and intellect. Flex is more associated with action rather than the usual power and magic. So, as we go through another set of the biggest flexes in Isekai, I hope you'll appreciate these gems involving characters and moments fundamentally different from last week's episode. But first, this video is sponsored by War Thunder. Alright, not... Look, I get that sponsor him, but he ain't sponsoring me. One show from 2014 where two siblings conquer oh, the fantasy world by... Alright, let's start things off with the most popular Isekai we're never getting a second season for. Which is a shame! That one show from 2014 where two siblings conquer a fantasy world by being really good at games. That's right, I'm talking about No Game No Life. A series filled with moments where our protagonists flex their skills after being underestimated. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I was to choose a show that best captured the essence of what I talked about in the intro, No Game No Life would probably be it. So, what is No Game No Life? Well, it's two prodigy gamers who get isekai'd into a world where everything is decided through games. Wanna fight for control over an entire country? A game of rock, paper, scissors would do just fine. Mm -hmm. The thing is, out of the 16 races that inhabit this world, humankind rests at the bottom. Their lack of affinity when it comes to magic have rendered them unable to sense when other races would use it to cheat. So, with Shiro and Sora being these lowly humans, it's only natural every opponent they face look down on them as weak, especially Jibril, who's going to be the victim of our flex this time. Now, to put into context just how unfair this matchup was, well, Sora and Shiro are just two regular humans. They can't use magic, and their only power is the extent of their intellect. As for Jibril, she comes from the sixth-ranked race, the Flugel. Literal god killers with a boundless capacity for knowledge who also happen to be immortal and possess one of the strongest abilities for magic. The core thing she prides herself the most on, though, is her unmatched intellectual and cognitive abilities. You see, when I say that she has a boundless capacity for knowledge, what I really mean is that her memory, calculative ability, learning ability, and tactical analysis are all practically infinite. Her IQ is completely off the charts, and her ability to absorb and retain all knowledge makes her a walking encyclopedia. Combine that with a mind that can recall all that information instantaneously, and what you get is a being who can react to every situation immediately and optimally. So, if gods didn't already exist in this world as a separate race, I would honestly say Shiro and Sora were facing one right now. That's just how big that gap between Flugels and humanity was. Now, because Jibril was extremely aware of that gap, she was so confident she was going to win that she was willing to offer anything as a reward should it happen, leading to their wager of 40,000 books for all her rights as an individual. So, with the stakes now set and players decided, the two parties would take part in a game of Shiritori, a simple word game in which each player takes turns saying words starting with the end of the previous word. The first person to repeat a word, not say anything in 30 seconds, or become unable to continue playing would lose the game and also the wager. 
The most important thing to note, though, is that in this version of Shiritori, anything said that's present will disappear, and anything not present will magically manifest itself. It's a variant to the game that Flugel liked to call Materialization Shiritori. Hmm. So, when the game began and Sora started with a literal nuke, what appeared above him was 27 tons of iron about to explode. A foreign weapon Jibril was unfamiliar with, yet in the few milliseconds she had to respond, she was able to counter with the materialization of a spell starting with the letter B. Sora would then respond with a spirit column, and the game would continue just like this with various things materializing and vanishing. Where the game starts to reach its climax is right after Sora would use the word lithosphere. He had created distance between himself and Jibril, then announced the move which would initiate the end. In the previous moves, he had gotten rid of the planet's outer core and mantle, mm -hmm. but because those were terms Jibril was unfamiliar with, she didn't understand what it was they were dematerializing. Once she began to fall to the core of the planet, though, she immediately knew their goal was to try and kill her. It was the most effective way of rendering her unable to continue playing. You see, even if she died only a trillionth of a second before them, the one who died first would be the one to lose. So, after some incredibly clever manipulation of the environment, Sora would lead Jibril into a situation where the only things left were the planet's core and a vacuum. It was a scenario he'd been working towards since the beginning in which, once Coulomb's force was taken away, an explosion the size of the Big Bang would happen instantaneously. Oof. I wouldn't really worry too much about the physics of it, but just know that what Sora created was a multiple light-year star system vaporizing hypernova. So That's even a if Jibril was confident her flugel traits would render her invincible to everything they could throw at her, nothing would save her from an explosion like this. It didn't matter how strong her flugel race was, because in the face of 50 billion degrees Celsius, all would be vaporized equally. As for how he'd led Jibril to the point that he could finish with that word, well, that was all a setup from the very beginning. He had predicted Jibril's arrogance would save him in the very first move, then used that knowledge to determine how she'd play all the way to the very end. So, not only did Sora create the most powerful attack in the history of Isekai, but he also outsmarted a being whose capacity for knowledge was infinite. He had slain a killer of gods with his words alone. Thus, the reason this is one of the biggest flexes in Isekai. Okay. It's all in a game of tic-tac-toe, in a way, as they're always saying. Next, Flux. <laughs> that one was for you, Nux. This yeah. one comes from Episode 9 of Vlog Horizon. Yes! A story very similar to SAO, except instead of a life or death survival game, it's more so a community of players adapting to their new life within a game. In a world where 30,000 gamers suddenly awake to find they're in their favorite game for real, they must come to terms with their new reality and figure out how it is they're going to live in this world governed like an MMO. So, in addition to all the game elements still being present, they also heavily influence the way the world works. Like, take a simple element like flavor text for example. Mm -hmm. Though in MMOs it's only used to give items lore and backstory, in this new world that text has begun to manifest itself into reality. Or something like party chat is now a form of telepathy for anyone on their friends list. So, with this world running on a mix of game mechanics and real world logic, it's not like a group of 30,000 gamers were going to band together and form this perfect society. In fact, with death not even being something they had to worry about and zero laws governing how players interacted, the state of their city was deteriorating rather quickly, bringing us now to the flex in question. After our protagonist Shiroe saw just how bad things were becoming, he had taken it upon himself to gather the leaders of various... Oh yes! I love this scene. Because the point that he legit... Proved a, a big freaking point that was that was obvious to him, but everybody else was, was ignoring it. Then have them discuss the deteriorating atmosphere of their new society, mainly in hopes they would come together and agree to his idea of establishing a new form of self-government. You see, with so much unethical behavior running rampant throughout even the biggest guilds, a set of rules needed to be established to create a more fair and balanced society. Mm -hmm. The thing about this idea coming from Shiroe, though, was that, unlike most of the other guilds present, he didn't have a massive backing in which to enforce, yet alone support his claims. He was just this single person who had used a bigger guild to help get himself in the room with all these other ones. Mm -hmm. Now, it was definitely true the lawless nature of the city made things difficult for other players, but if the big guilds were the ones who were benefiting from it, then they saw zero need to change their ways and to create rules against it. 
It was a reaction Shiroe cleverly anticipated and created countermeasures for. So, prior to this meeting having even begun, Shiroe had secured financing from one of the most powerful trade guilds and used that money to purchase the very building this meeting was taking place in. What was the building they were in, you might ask? Well, that would be the highly essential guild center. The multi-purpose structure in which all players had to enter in order to create a guild, join a guild, or leave a guild. With it also being home to the only bank in the city, that made it the single place in which players could access the valuable items and resources stored there. So, not only did Shiro now have full control over the very location in which all guilds used to manage themselves, but he now also possessed the ability to restrict access to all their assets. By be just because, and he pointed out this, just because y'all, they are in a new world that you could be lawless, lawless does not mean you have to be. Because at the end of the day, who's going to defend the person, the weak, you know? Who's going to defend the weak? Because in the weirdest way, that's the duty of the strong to protect the weak. To make sure they the weak become strong. Becoming the sole owner of the guild sector, he had essentially made himself the admin of it. He the alone villain possessed glasses. the ability to modify its own settings. Permissions that allowed him to choose who could enter and who could exit. That being the case, Shiroe had effectively created a means to enforce laws for even the biggest guilds. Should any of them choose not to abide, then as punishment, Shiroe could just lock them out and restrict their access to everything. Mm -hmm. All their money and all their items would immediately vanish behind an impenetrable barrier from which they couldn't access anymore, which to most guilds was practically a death sentence. So, with yep. the other guilds backed into a corner of Shiroe's creation, they had no choice but to accept what he was asking of them. In one fell swoop, Shiroe had secured rights for players being misused and mistreated and mm -hmm. established a form of government which would help to improve the public order. All through a genius move no one even thought to be possible. Yes, it did involve a little bit of blackmail, but it was a very fitting act for a player whose nickname was the Villain in Glasses. But it's not like creating a council to help make society better was really a bad thing. He mm -hmm. was just abusing the rules of his new reality, much like how the bigger guilds were already doing to others. Mm -hmm. It was the flex of his wit that showed his true nature as the master strategist for one of the most infamous groups in Elder Tale. Mm -hmm. Okay, these next two anime I did talk about already last time, but the flexes in both are just too satisfying not to include. Yeah. Plus, I just really like talking about Gate. So, since you should... Again, I would love a season, th season three of Gate. I said in the last video... I enjoy Gate so much. It's a damn good anime. You familiar with the premise already? Let's go straight to talking about it's, the flex. Yes. This the one coming from episode 8 of season 1. To bring you up to speed with a little bit of context, our protagonist Itami was called to speak in front of what's essentially Japan's Senate. Him and his group had just fought off a dragon, and both parties of the government had prepped questions pertaining to that and the refugees he brought with him all of which was to be streamed on national television. Of course, with this being a highly politically motivated summit, it was only natural the opposition party choose questions that would make the current government look bad. Like, if they could make it seem as if the current government couldn't handle the special region, then perhaps reform from their end would become possible. That being the case, numerous questions would be asked trying to get some sort of negative response from Itami, Lele, and Tuka, but none would give an answer this councilwoman could work with. Nothing she asked was making it seem like the JSTF was failing at their duties. When she finally got to Rory and saw her gothic attire though, the councilwoman knew this was the opportunity she was looking for. You see, if this girl was wearing dark clothes like that, then for sure she had to be mourning the loss of someone close to her. Someone the councilwoman knew she could blame the JSTF for not being able to protect. So, as she grilled Rory with question after question, she became increasingly arrogant as Rory could only respond with silence and confusion. She mistakenly assumed she was backing Rory into a corner. But just as she thought she was about to get the answer exposing... Not really knowing... She was barking at a dragon, literally in the form of a lowly goth Lolita girl. The JSDF's failures... What she got instead was an extremely satisfying combo of humiliation and disrespect. You see, rather than answer stating how the JSDF failed her, Rory simply asked if this councilwoman was an idiot. 
She would ask this multiple different times, and after each and every instance, she would refer to the woman as Little Girl. So not only did this councilwoman just have her Or the dove or Little Miss thing, which is even worse. That's, a, that's uh. To me, look, calling a grown woman a little girl, and also, or the dove version calling her a little miss thing, it's like saying you're just a little B I T C H. Debunked, but she was also being reprimanded by a girl seemingly 20 years younger than her. Mm. Like, straight up insulted for asking such idiotic questions. Not to mention all while being called a little girl the entire time, which I should remind you was also on national television. Mm -hmm. So, as the councilwoman tried to save whatever microscopic fragment of face she had left, she attempted to grasp the only bit of leverage she could. The fact that she was older and the younger girl should respect their elders. Where Rory completely ends this woman's career, though, is by showing just how wrong she was even with that. She was pretty much ending this verbal debate with a fatality. I mean, here this councilwoman was failing her job and being called an idiot, and right when she just so arrogantly scolded Rory to respect their elders, Itami steps in to hit her with the Uno reverse card. He revealed Rory to be the oldest person out of everyone. Now, I don't know if a flex of age is something just any person would be proud of, but I guess if you're an immortal demigod, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So, as soon as it was revealed that Rory was actually 961 years old, the councilwoman could only stare in shock at her utter defeat. It was a classic case of someone being confidently incorrect, to mm. which it is always satisfying to see them get to put in their place. Yep. Now, I wouldn't really call the age reveal a flex on its own, but when given the whole lead-up as to how it happens, it's that entire interaction with Rory that makes it one. Everything from her demeanor to the way she responded and reacted were all elements that I think make this scene one of the biggest flexes in Isekai. Alright. This last flex, though very simple, is actually significantly bigger than the one I showed last time for Yojo Senki. Since I had watched the movie so long ago, I completely forgot this scene had even happened. So, for those oh who yeah, way, yeah, because also CJ the Champ. Also, I need to. That's a video that I need to react to. But I saw it long, oh, way like over a year ago. Is when I saw the movie as well. Basically, when you took over an entire country. Planting your flag, which he's going to talk about, and start singing your natural anthem. A flex from the beginning of Yojo Senki's first and only movie. The Rushi Federation had just declared war on the Empire, and Tanya's battalion would be tasked with supporting the front lines by any means necessary. The thing is, since the mission she was previously on had them located behind enemy lines, supporting the front didn't necessarily mean physically going and fighting them. It was far easier to just go straight to the enemy capital instead. They were already halfway there, and it would be much faster than taking the long way around while safely trying mm -hmm. to get to their side of the front. So, what better way to support the front lines than to strike the enemy capital and create a strategic diversion there? It would for sure get the Federation forces to turn around and in turn provide the front lines support in a different way. As for how they were just gonna waltz in and start blasting the enemy capital, well, that was because the Federation's anti-air was useless. They simply weren't equipped to deal with a battalion of mages like Tanya's, nor were they even expecting to. So, with an objective to blow stuff up and to mock the enemy, the flex in question comes from the latter part of this mission. I mean, it was rather badass that she just mm -hmm. started attacking the enemy capital only hours after they declared war on them, but Tanya herself mentioned just how easy that was. Where we see a true flex that utterly decimates the enemy is the tactic Tanya had used to mock them. It wasn't the destruction of their bases or the annihilation of their monuments, but instead the absolute disrespect to them, their country, and everything their country stood yeah. for. It wasn't enough to just cause some havoc and return to base. So, in addition to crippling major parts of their infrastructure, Tanya went on to embarrass them some more. She would retrieve a camera from a local film studio, take the Imperial flags they had as props, then proceed to create a propaganda video right in the heart of the enemy capital. She would sing the anthem of the Empire she fought for, amplify it so the people of the capital could hear it, then fly the Empire's flag around major landmarks ensuring the best shots of burning destruction could be caught for the video. Then, to top it all off, Tanya made sure to capture the Imperial flag waving on every key government building. She would burn all the Federation flags they'd come across, then plant their own right in the center of the enemy capital square, leaving it as a stark reminder of who it was that just humiliated them. Mm -hmm. So, 
Though this once did abolish... Because they're the one who did not stop the war. But they're the one who finished it. <laughs> well, for some like the others, singing their anthem and waving their flag right in the middle of enemy territory was the element that made this so incredibly satisfying. Mm -hmm. It was such an unexpected act that really added on to the layers of disrespect here. That's the reason it too is one of the biggest flexes in Isekai. But yeah, that's another set of the four biggest flexes in Isekai. We may not have seen those typical displays of overwhelming power, but these were definitely just as satisfying as all the others. Now, since Mushoku Tensei is starting up in a week, I probably won't be doing another one of these for at least a month. Instead, we'll be going back to the weekly cut content and news videos. So, if you want to see more flexes, but from all anime in general, then I highly recommend checking out Nuts' videos instead. He's okay. 100% the reason I even made these ones in the first place. Now, before I go, I just want to thank War Thunder once again for sponsoring this video. I know I talked about Alright, well, they're not sponsoring, so sorry. But yeah, like I said, it's plenty of flexes in anime, but mainly in Isekai. And there's, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, but that being said, if you like any of this content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Like, comment, and subscribe to any news. I will leave the original link to this video down below in the description so you can watch it uninterrupted. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Till next time, please take care of yourself. It's going to get even hotter around here. So please stay hydrated. Till next time, peace out.